Hi everyone, Joshua Hanlon here, and today I'm joined by Russell from BrickLink, and he's going to be taking us through the BrickLink AFAL Designer Program. So right now we are in Billen, Denmark for several days while the AFAL Designer Program goes through the steps of choosing which designs will ultimately be offered for sale to the public. And so Russell, if you want to kind of take us through a general overview of what this program is and kind of the, the steps that we're going through right now, and then we'll dive into more of what you've been doing here for these days in Billen. Sure. Well, um, the AFOL Designer Program was designed to uh, fill a little bit of a hole in the market uh, for what we call long tail uh, sets, meaning that uh, they're short production runs uh, that the Lego company normally wouldn't produce, but uh, they're specifically designed for the AFOL market by AFOL designers. And we've had a competition up to this point where we have been able to um, receive approximately 450 entries and uh, we narrowed those down pretty quickly to a certain number and uh, that we felt we could actually test in the period of a week. And uh, that's why we're here in Billund to actually run the test, build the models, uh, evaluate what they look like. Um, most of these models probably weren't built um, out of bricks, out of real bricks. They were designed with the studio program. And uh, that means that all we have seen so far are renders. Uh, and uh, the renders are very good, but there's nothing like real life and turning the model around and holding it in your hands and seeing how stable it is. And so that's pretty much what we're doing here. And at the end of the week, we'll make a decision as to what, which models will go on to the crowdfunding process, which starts uh, tentatively at this point in February. And so when we actually get this video start or posted, uh, that process will have started the crowdfunding process. So these sets that are being chosen uh, will be available for sale. Uh, but right now we'll kind of get a look at kind of what that process was like so that uh, when people are watching this, they can kind of know what went into all of this. So I, one thing you mentioned that I think is a really big part of this is the studio program that BrickLink uses that everyone had to, to build in for the program. So if you want to talk a little bit more about that and kind of how that ties in with the, the designer program. Right. So the studio was a uh, tool that was developed um, several years ago by a BrickLink related uh, company. Um, it technically, I think, is, is owned by BrickLink right now, but we've always had connections with the studio folks, and uh, that connection is going to become stronger over the coming uh, months and years. Uh, so studio was developed with the, with the idea that it could help people buy on BrickLink and fulfill their dreams and reality. So it's one thing to design um, in a uh, virtual environment like Studio, uh, but we made it so that it could plug right into BrickLink and you could get you could source your parts. So that's really the reason why Studio was started. Now we had to make several upgrades to Studio in order to make it suitable for this program. One of the important things was and one of the only and one of the reasons frankly why we could do a program like this is because we were able to limit the kinds of bricks that people could use to what we call the the builder's pallet and that was basically the active elements that, that the Lego company currently is producing, um, minus some things that we thought uh, wouldn't be appropriate. And there were some limitations of studio itself, uh, for example, like uh, maybe rubber bands, uh, some of the elements that flow, string is another example, where studio couldn't handle that. And so we had to make some changes, uh, some limitations um, based on that. But other than that, it's basically the active elements that you will see in sets. Um, and uh, because we were able to limit that, uh, that enabled us to give complete freedom within that palette to builders. So that meant they weren't limited by the bricks they could buy and source and sets that they had. They could pretty much do anything. Now we, we did stipulate at the beginning that we didn't want people uh, basically building parts packs for this for this type of... <laughs> this wasn't your opportunity to just throw in all your favorite parts no. in some weird combination in a set. No. This was, You had to actually have a, a good design. Right. And so, and so there were issues like that. And Studio was designed with some of the limitations built in. For example, you had to build something that was more than 200 pieces but less than 2,000 pieces. Um, 
We had a stability check on it, but that wasn't a requirement. But you had to use elements just from the palette, otherwise the thing wouldn't upload. And so that was really the main thing that we wanted um, from Studio. And uh, and we had to, like I said, we had to upgrade a lot of things in order to make it so that it would be mainstream enough that everyone could use it. You know, usability, all kinds of things like this. So um, this, I think that Studio is central to this program. We couldn't do it without it. And there's many things that we're going to be working on with Studio to improve it in the future. Mm -hmm. So that's a great overview of the design program there. So then that kind of takes us to today. So everybody built and submitted uh, their, their models uh, for submission. And I think they're the numbers on the website, but do you know how many models were submitted? Yes, uh, there were actually uh, 443, I think, to be exact, okay. and um, that's a lot of submissions to go through. Um, there were a lot of them that, frankly, didn't meet even the basic rules, so that we, we uh, archived them right away. But uh, it was quite a decision-making process uh, for the several days after the submission period was ended, where we sort of narrowed everything down. But yeah, the rules were that you had to submit through Studio. And uh, if you had to learn Studio, you couldn't just send a picture in of something. And um, that's the way we were able to control at least some of what people uh, have, uh, you know, submitted. Mm -hmm. So now then take us through what's been going on kind of these last couple of days. And we'll go through here for the next few days as you work through these models and kind of decide, you know, here's what we, we think would make a good set. And here's what we want to offer to the public and what this process is like. Right. Well, um, of course, there's a lot of things we can't say about mm -hmm. the, the models themselves, but the process is pretty simple. Um, I think it's similar to the process that the LEGO company itself goes through in determining whether a set is worthy of, of, of being uh, sold or not. Um, we do have the ability to correct some things, and this is sort of a little bit of a, a sticking point. One of the things we told designers at the beginning was that basically the design in the form that they submitted it would be produced without a lot. We put a little stipulation in there that we could correct some things for stability and so forth. But by and large, it is what they submitted. And that's much different than a process where you give a model over and basically um, designers, other like third party, will change everything based on uh, their needs at the time, you know. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why it was critical for us to have elements that could be sourced directly from Lego because if you don't if if people would use other elements then we would have to replace them. So at the end of the week we'll we'll make a decision as to which ones will move on. But it's been very interesting to see as each model is revealed, uh, and that's one of the other things we probably could say is that none of the models were revealed to any of the people building the models until they actually got the parts in front of them. And sometimes they didn't even get the image. They started building with the instructions to, just to see later on what would happen, mm -hmm. which means that it's been a very exciting process this whole week to see these designs that have come along. And uh, for us who are in the administration of the program, we've seen the designs all along, and there's certain ones that we sort of cheer for silently um, and uh, but but to see the reactions and to see what actually happens when people build it is just a great uh, great experience and um, and you really see why it's necessary to do this kind of step um, as opposed to just people submitting a file online and having pieces just arrive in the mail you know there's a this is a critical thing and we are able to um, really make a lot of serious corrections and and things that will will really help with the appeal of these sets. And, and, and don't forget, one of the things about this program is that we need to sell what we are producing. It's not something where we're just doing it as a benefit to the community or something. We consider it a benefit, but um, we need to make this thing profitable. And, and if, peop if nobody buys the sets and there's no appeal, then there's sort of no point. So that's, that's part of what's going on here is people will say, we've talked about price points and uh, we're going to have a little competition on Friday uh, with amongst ourselves, giving everyone so much money to, to sort of buy virtually what they would see, just to see where things are at. I don't know how much that's going to influence the outcome totally, but all along we've been thinking, would this set do well with the AFAL market? Because we all know the AFAL market, but maybe from a little different perspective, and everyone has their favorites. But really, this is one of those things where... Um, 
it's subjective, but at the end of the day, I think we're going to come to a conclusion that most people agree with. Now, I know one thing that some people have been uh, a little bit confused about, and I think you can definitely help clarify this, is uh, what is the, the Lego company's involvement been with this as far as how they have worked with, with you guys at BrickLink uh, on the program and kind of throughout this whole process and you know, going forward as, as the sets are offered to the public? What exactly kind of have they done along the way and how does that work? So um, the involvement with uh, from Lego, first of all, everyone should know that legally speaking, this program is owned by Lego. And uh, now the question of whose idea it was to begin with is sort of a tough question to ask or to, or to well, it's not hard to ask, but it's hard to answer um, because it depends on what you mean by that. I mean, for a long time, BrickLink has wanted to be a place where people could realize their their designs in real bricks that really you know that's one of the reasons that's the reason why our company bricklink survives or or does anything is because uh, people are wanting to buy the actual bricks and that sometimes people wonder if studio is really undermining our market because you know if you build virtually then you don't buy you know but the idea is is that people if they want to buy um, they can they can come in through bricklink from lego's point of view um, this is their program, but it's something that BrickLink had wanted to do. If you remember back to the mock shop, uh, this was something that that um, that Lego wanted to, or, or that BrickLink wanted to provide for its users this opportunity to realize. And and what happened there was that we couldn't source enough parts. That was basically what happened. Um, we couldn't do enough sets to really make it profitable for us. And then of course. That's always the bottom line with with our company. We have to we have to we can't just do things as a benefit to the to the uh, AFOL community. Uh, so I think that uh, the Legos I, I think that Legos involvement with this um, is, comes somewhat from that. But of course they have their own objectives too, and they have they are very interested in the relationship with the AFOL community. And um, this I think is something that they feel will matter to people and uh, is um, a great way also of working with BrickLink. Um, it's interesting because BrickLink is technically a third-party marketplace, but um, and we've always had a relationship with the Lego company one way or the other, respectful relationship, but we've never really worked together like hand-in-hand -hand like this. So that's one of those things where I think people are watching to see how this is, is developing how it's possible for a big company and a small company to work together for this common group. It's a very unusual thing, too. Most companies don't have um, fans like our, our AFOL community and, and other things, other businesses that have grown up around like this. It's a very unusual situation. So I think this is part of, it's part of a big experiment, uh, at least at this point. If, we, if it goes on, of course, in this forum, people will probably... Uh, um, know what to expect but at this point there's a lot of things where people are looking to see what happens and i think from lego's perspective that's one of the big attractions of this mm -hmm. So then let's take a deeper dive now into kind of your specific role uh, over these days here in Billing, because I know you've got your laptop here, you've got, you know, spreadsheets and things going on. So if you want to kind of talk about some of the, the nitty gritty and kind of what you've been doing as, uh, you know, other builders and designers have been helping build uh, the actual models that were submitted. Right. So um, we each have a role uh, in our in, in this in this group. We had a meeting on Monday night on Sunday night where most of everyone was there, and uh, we just got to know each other. And at that point, we were all just AFALs. Some of us worked for Lego, some of us worked for BrickLink, other people were coming in from the outside, and we all pretty much had one goal. But when we got into the room on Monday morning and started working, everyone goes to their roles. We have these builders who come in that are just incredible. They, uh, they've they honed their skills over the years and they really know what to look for. And these guys could build things without instructions, you know, but we, we, we have them working on things. We also have, of course, the media folks who are here and talking. Um, then we have the administration of the program who's interested in keeping things moving along. And BrickLink's role in this, they sent three of us over, one basically for media purposes, and the other two of us were sent over here for technical reasons, um, basically trying to ensure that we get a good parts list and to to solve problems that might happen with Studio. And so we've been producing instructions and we've been solving problems. And one of the things we find 
in addition to the uh, part substitutions that we we did because of uh, insufficiency of parts or different problems that we had with part numbers and things like that, um, builders will sometimes say, you know, it would be so much better in this situation or we could make it stable if we just added a, a two by two plate uh, here. And so we need we have to source that plate. Um, and you might think that because this is billand that you could just walk outside and pull a two by two plate off of the tree. And, <laughs> you mean that's not how it works? <laughs> oh, that's right. Or you could just pull a brick up off the street. There are a lot of bricks around, but we we are uh, fortunate to be able to source these bricks from the designer's workshop, which is a wonderful place where all the current active elements are stored. Um, I, as a non-LEGO uh, employee, can't go in there, but we have the LEGO employees who are in the administration of this. They will go and source parts that we want. So practically what I'm doing is I am trying, I'm identifying the part that the builders want, and I put it in a form that is that is um, something that the LEGO team can understand. So we, the, the department we're working with in LEGO is the AFAL engagement group, and they're not necessarily uh, technical LEGO experts. So that's one of the things, like I provide the image, if you want to just show the uh, screen here, um, I provide the image for a lot of these uh, uh, parts, and I also provide the Lego number. And uh, then after we get an order in, we get parts that just sort of appear magically <laughs> on the table. And uh, these are things that people have asked for. And it may seem like a very, uh, like an easy thing to just get parts, but Brick or, or, or Lego has produced so many parts and different varieties over the years. It can be it can be hard to identify the exact color and part, and so that's basically what I'm doing here is offering corrections to uh, to instructions, and um, we have we have correction sheets here. I won't go through what all these colors and everything mean, but you can see that the Lego uh, images are here. We have the part name, the part number, and even with all of this, sometimes we have problems in terms of getting the exact right part. And sometimes we'll get the part, and then it won't work, and then we'll have to get another part. So the trick for us is here this week um, is to limit the creative energies of some of our designers to a practical point, because literally they could go on improving models for weeks at a time. This is what they do. They love to do this kind of thing. But we have to be practical and say, okay, we're going to do this many corrections. If we have to do any more, we're going to put it on the back burner and we're going to go on to another model. Um, but it's exciting to try to come up with ideas with these parts. And uh, it exposes me to the parts. And I don't. this is something uh, that I've noticed here. I know maybe it's just a crazy psychological thing, but the Lego parts here in Bill and feel better than any other any other Lego. It's a I've, purer source here. It is. We're so close to where things were developed that just I actually bought a Lego set in the uh, in the hotel lobby and put it together. And I'll tell you, it was just a different experience. <laughs> that everything the plastic feels more crisp. I don't know. I don't know if that's just my imagination, but I do. When when I see these parts just come over from the uh, designing workshop, I just think, boy. Uh, that you can't get any closer than this mm -hmm. unless you were an actual designer. So <laughs> there you go. So you're kind of the go between them, between the, the builders who are working on the, the models that the fans submitted, uh, and they're, they're sitting there and working on these models and then telling you, okay, we need this certain piece in this right. quantity. And then you, you know, put that in your list and send that to the, the Lego employees here in Billing and say, okay, can you go and get this piece for me? Exactly right. And then the more critical thing that we're actually doing is any kind of uh, deviation in the instructions. So if someone wants to replace a plate or another or a brick or something like that with another one, we need to have a record of that. And uh, because we are needing to make a, a list of materials, and we also need to change the instructions. So we have to make sure everything lines up so that when we put in the order for these parts, it's accurate. We don't want a situation where we're packing sets sometime in February or March or April and we don't have enough of something. Or worse, to send out sets and have people complain, I don't have three of this part, 
um, we don't know what happened. So, and then at that point, it becomes very costly to fix the mistake. You have to be sending out things to people. And really, we don't want to have to do that. It might happen. You know, this is the first run of a program, but we're doing everything humanly possible to make sure that that doesn't happen. And it means checking things and checking things and checking things. I check um, BrickLink. I check a list of active, of active elements that I've been given. I check with models. I check the instructions. I check with, with different people that we have here, experts. So it's a constant thing of checking and checking until you really can't do any more checking, and then you just hope that everything is going to work out. Mm -hmm. You just hope for the best eventually right. but uh, after you put in the work. But right. then the, these kits that are available then for people to buy once the, the whole you know choosing process is over, are they aimed at a particular age group or type of builder, or are you kind of going for a, the whole gamut of, of you know young and old and all different skill levels? Well, um, actually, that's a, that's a very good question, and it's a question that we didn't really know at first. When we first started with the program, and we talked to some LEGO representatives about it, we sort of had in our in our mind what it would be like. Um, but as time has gone over, I think both we and the LEGO company have come to ideas about what it actually is going to be. Um, and one of the our target range as was stated from the beginning, and it's still the same, is uh, 18 and over. It's the AFAL designer market. Now, if somebody um, who is not an AFAL comes in and wants to buy the sets, we're not going to say no, <laughs> but I don't think we're going to be doing a lot of specific marketing to outside of that um, group of people. And so it, it, it has an effect. We, we told everyone at the beginning, all the builders and, and everyone uh, who was involved this week, that that our target audience is not children. It's it's uh, people who are uh, 18 and over. And that means that we don't have to maybe have building instructions that make it easy. We can do demanding things. We don't want things that are unsafe for anybody. And we don't want unstable builds or crazy, crazy things that are, that are you know, constructions that just are, are very difficult for anyone to handle. But at the same time, we don't feel like to... We're not going to duplicate the the the, uh, the Lego market in any way. This is something entirely separate, and um, and so in a way, it's a freeing thing for designers. And we actually we told um, the the builders who uh, submitted designs. It was in it was in the the criteria. I said this is this is your target audience, and these are the kinds of things you need to be thinking about. Um, if you design things too simply, it's not going to be engaging for someone who's older. But at the same time, you don't want to go crazy either and make it so that only the, the experts of the experts could ever assemble the set that you have. <laughs> exactly. You want, to, you want to make it accessible to people still. Right. right. Oh, definitely. And we, uh, we hope we'll be able to sell out all of the sets. We know right now that our maximum amount uh, um, for these sets is 2500 So in many ways, that seems like a small amount when you consider regular Lego runs of sets. Um, but for us as a small company to sell that amount, it it you know it could feasibly be close to fifty thousand sets. That's a tremendous amount of packing and of sorting and of selling, and it's a big responsibility too when you consider how much all of this costs and how we're going to handle this customer service. So there's a lot still that we have yet to do, but this week is sort of a critical point in establishing the quality of what we have, and we have to say that. Everyone has been unanimous on this point that we're very, very pleased with the quality of submissions that have come in. They've just been tremendous, and when we see these designs realized, they just pop out at us. So we're going to have some real hard decisions to make when it comes to Friday. Um, and we've already made some hard decisions coming into this, into this week, but I think as it gets closer and closer to the top, um, the, the, the hard decisions or the decisions are going to become harder. Now, ultimately, the decisions, though, are going to be up to the community because they're the ones that crowdfund. Any any design that we think is a great, great thing and we put it out there, um, it doesn't really matter at some point if nobody buys it um, because then it won't even pass crowdfunding and we won't do a full production run of that set. Uh, it won't go on sale. In fact, you won't be able to get it. So in order for these, these to be uh, viable... We give the community the last word, and uh, so it's not going to be produced unless people really like it. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think that's a really good overview then of the whole program and kind of what's been happening here in Billing during these days of uh, choosing the sets here. So then if you can just kind of give people uh, more info on where they can go to, to check out more about the program and where, where they can go to keep an eye out for the sets that are available. Um, so the place to keep an eye out is, uh, is the BrickLink website. If you go to the studio banner, you will see uh, a, a page there that will that will explain everything. And we keep that page updated. We want to keep people engaged with the program, even when apparently nothing is going on from the public end. We've got a timeline there, and we'll keep you announced, and uh, we'll keep you briefed on things. And we plan on, uh, you know, talking about the designs as they come out. Um, I think in terms of shipping them we hope we hope we'll be able to get them out sometime in the spring we're we're realizing now that to set hard dates for things is is it's it's hard because this is a new program and we don't really know a lot of the things uh, in terms of timing and so forth we predict and we do the best we can but if you really would like uh, some of these designs the best thing is to uh, look at the crowdfunding uh, page when it comes up and then just to uh, just to put your orders in and hope for the best, you know, and we really think that most of them are going to get crowdfunded. I personally think they're all going to have no problems. In fact, some of them may even sell out during crowdfunding. So if you really see something you like, it's probably best to put an order in for it right away instead of waiting because you never know what could happen um, if, you know, with the Internet. Uh, at that point, we will allow images from these sets to be placed anywhere as advertisement and once that happens if, if a set just takes off it can it can be gone in a matter of hours so um that's my advice is to act soon yes, <laughs> for sure and there are some truly excellent designs uh, as we've been spending time here at bill and, and and going over with the designers with some of these so i think you're right i think a lot of them will uh sell out quickly uh so definitely everyone watching this make sure to to check the description for links to everything that russell mentioned and info on where you can go to check out all of the sets that are available we'll make sure to have all that info down below for you guys but thank you so much russell for sitting down with me here and kind of giving us this behind the scenes look at everything that bricklink and lego are doing here I think this is a fascinating new program, and I really hope that you guys can continue to do this over the years. So thank you. Very good. Thanks very much.